Hello. How's everyone doing today? Um, oops, I got the wrong schedule up. Let me bring up the, uh, the correct schedule. Here we go. So welcome back to Computer Science 3200. Where is my Zoom? All right. So unfortunately, I was not feeling well yesterday afternoon. I was not physically capable of uh, giving a lecture. So the live version of this lecture is late. Um, but for the most of you, you're going to be watching this right before the exam to study anyway, right? Let's be real. So uh, you're watching this at the normal time anyway. So yeah, we are talking about game theory today. So game theory um, is a very important topic uh, when it comes to understanding certain parts of artificial intelligence, in my opinion, especially when it comes to understanding the algorithm that we're going to be talking about for assignment three, which is called the Minimax algorithm. And so we're going to talk a little bit about game theory today and uh, a little bit on the next lecture as well. And then that will all tie together um, when it comes to its sort of climax with the Minimax algorithm. And then there will be questions about the, the game theory stuff on the midterm. So let's hop right into it, shall we? So. Computer Science 3200, lecture number eight, Intro to Game Theory. So this is the first of a two lectures on game theory. So I actually sent out a message to the people in the class on Discord with a game that I wanted to play. Now, I'm just going to show the first results of this game. We're going to play this game again in the next lecture, and we're going to see how the results might change once you sort of know what's going on with that game. So this game is called Choosing Numbers, and everyone in the class secretly chose a number between 1 and 100. So I sent out a Google form, and you had to choose a number between 1 and 100. And the way the game works is that we will calculate the average number for everyone chosen in class, and then the winner of the game is the person closest to two-thirds of the average number chosen. And so it's, the game has some interesting properties. If you think about it in depth, it, it actually is sort of this iterative thing where you can do like logic on top of logic. But I just want to really quickly show the results from the first playing of that game without having analyzed it at all. So here are the results from the first playing of that game. We had the average number chosen as 44.3. And so two thirds of the average was 29.5555. And we had someone who chose a 30, and so that person exactly chose two-thirds of the average. Well, within integers, right? So, um, nobody else chose a 30, so if you were the person who, who filled this out at 2.27 um, p.m. yesterday, and you filled in that 30, congratulations, you won this round of the betting. Of course, there is no prize for this round of the betting, but I just wanted to show you that sort of asking people to play this game with no analysis of the game will yield dramatically different results, typically, after we've analyzed the game a little bit in the next class, and then we'll play it again and we'll see how, how the responses differ a little bit. Okay, so pause the video now, give a little think about this game, and ask yourself, like, what did you think the average was going to be? How did you choose your number? What is the logic that you use to choose your number? And then the next lecture, we'll revisit this game and we'll see how everyone sort of does now that, now that we know how the, the logic of the game unfolds. So, game theory. What is game theory? You may have heard of this before. It is essentially mathematical models for decision making. And so, it's an analysis of strategic actions in scenarios which can be defined as games, okay? And, and in game theory, we're not like talking about chess necessarily. We're talking about um, social sciences, computer science, economics. So if you want to say, if you have a, uh, a company and you're releasing it for an IPO or you're trying to auction off a bunch of assets or you're trying to make a strategic business decision, or even like in your love life making decisions. It's often like, it's a good idea to apply some rudimentary game theory to your decision making process. And the really unfortunate thing is that you go through your whole life, probably, unless you're doing an economics or pure math degree, nobody teaches us how to make decisions. 
right? The, the most anyone ever tells us is follow your dreams and everything will be all right. That's not necessarily true, right? If your dreams are unfortunately something that society does not value in a way that you can be financial, financially successful, then you may have to forego your dreams in order to make some money, right? That is a very realistic thing that happens. And so maybe when you make important decisions in your life, it would be good if someone had taught you any sort of rudimentary decision making um, throughout, you know, junior high, high school, university, whatever. And so hopefully within these lectures, no, you're not going to maybe make the best decisions of your life or whatever. This isn't going to be like completely life changing, but it is a way of thinking about things, which is more mathematical than say, um, typically like the emotional reasons why people make decisions. And if you've ever made a decision based on emotions, you know what I'm talking about. Sometimes they don't work out for the best, right? So if we can slow down, put some math on top of things and then like, think about it for a little bit, analyze it for a little bit, maybe we can make a better decision. So we're going to do this with some examples. So here's an example called the grades game. And now this is just a completely contrived example. Um, and all the numbers that I'm choosing here are just completely made up. They have some intuition behind them, but we're just inventing a game that has, you know, no real world consequences that we can apply some analysis to. So here's what that game is. Two players are playing this game. Let's say it's me and you, for example. And two players secretly and simultaneously make a choice with a defined outcome. So by secretly and simultaneously, what I mean is I make my decision, maybe I write it down on a piece of paper, and you make your decision, write it down on a piece of paper, and then without discussing what we've chosen, we reveal our answers, right? So I have not had the opportunity necessarily to discuss what I have chosen before you make your decision, and you have not told me what you chose before I make my decision. This is a simultaneous um, decision game. And so the choices in this game, I'm just giving Greek letters to, right? So this could be, this could mean something else in the real world, but for this particular game, the choices are just alpha or beta. Whatever that means, I don't know. I'm just giving it a symbol. And so those symbols are alpha or beta. And here are the rules of the particular instance of this game. If I choose alpha and you choose alpha, I get a B minus in the course, okay? So this is a, a weird grades game. Like we're just choosing these symbols and then there's this table of values, right? So if I choose alpha and they choose alpha, I get a B minus. However, if I chose alpha and they chose beta, I get an A. Instead, if I had chose beta and they choose alpha, I get a C. And if I choose beta and they choose beta, I get a B plus. So for those one or two of you who may be watching live, so if you're watching this pre-recorded, please pause the video now and just think about what you would choose. I know that typically you won't do that, but please just pause the video and just think for a second about what you would choose and then make a choice. So out there in the chat, type what you would, would you choose alpha or would you choose beta? And then after you've typed that, just give me any sort of reason why you may have chosen that. And then I'll read from those reasons. So I'll give you a second to pause so you can think about your choice. Okay, so, and I know this class isn't at the regularly scheduled time, so there's almost nobody watching live, so that's fine. So we got a few people out there. Okay, someone chose alpha. So why did you choose alpha? I'm just curious why you chose alpha. I like to have this conversation with people because it's interesting, right? Um, alpha because it sounds better and is more common. Okay, hopefully your choice depends on the outcomes and not how cool the symbol looks. Um, someone said, so because it is the better of the two, what do you mean by that? What do you mean the better of the two? We have to be very specific here. And while you're answering that, um, so with these sort of long form descriptions of games, if I choose this and they choose this, I get this. If I choose this and they get this, this can be a little bit difficult to digest in your mind, right? So what we're going to do is we're going to come up with a very clean way of looking at this. All right, so someone said, I think more people will choose alpha 
And so if you think more people will choose alpha and you want to choose alpha, then you'll get a B minus, right? So we'll, we'll see. So there's lots of different reasons why people could cho choose different things. But let's take our game. And instead of having it in this long form paragraph definition, we'll put it into a matrix, okay? So this is the exact same game, but it's specified in a matrix. And so what it says is if I, me, and if you're looking at this, this is you, right? So if I choose alpha and my partner chooses alpha, then I'm gonna, I'm gonna get a B minus. If I choose alpha and my partner chooses beta, they're, I'm going to get an A. However, if I choose beta and they choose alpha, I'm going to get a C. If I choose beta and they choose beta, I'm going to get a B plus. Okay, so these are the results. These are my grades. But of course, there are two people playing this game. I'm playing the game and the other person, the partner, is also playing the game. So let's write down the grades that my partner would get if we were playing this game. So if I chose alpha and they chose alpha, then they would get a B minus, okay? If I chose alpha and they chose beta, well, that's this situation where I chose alpha and they chose beta, okay? So um, down here, this would be, uh, sorry, this would be a C for the partner. If I chose beta and they chose alpha, the partner would get an A. And if we both chose beta, then we would both, then they would get a B plus. So what I'm going to do is instead of having two matrices, if I take these values and I put them right here like this, so I take this one and I put this one right here side by side, I take this one, I put it right here and I take this one and I put it right here, then I get this. Okay, so that is what this matrix is. And this is the matrix that we are going to be dealing with for the, uh, the rest of the game theory lectures. So someone says, I'll still get a good grade either way with alpha, but there's a chance for the grade C with beta. Okay, there you go. So that's the type of reasoning that I'm looking for. So someone said, um, if they chose alpha, what I think you're trying to say is that the worst case scenario is better than the worst case scenario if you chose beta, right? So that's a good line of reasoning is to actually look at the outcomes and see whether or not like the outcomes are better for, for either thing. So that, that's good logic. Whether or not that's right, I'm not sure, but we'll see. So this is what this matrix means. If I choose alpha and they choose alpha, I'll get a B minus, they'll get a B minus. If I choose alpha and they choose beta, I'll get an A and they'll get a C. If I choose beta and they get and they choose alpha, I'll get a C, they'll get an A. And if we both choose beta, we both get a B plus. So on the left here, that is my outcome. And on the right is their outcome. And this is called the, called the outcome matrix. And when you look at a game, you can, you know, this is a game with outcomes. And this is called a matrix game. And it's the matrix form of a game because it essentially says, if I choose this and they choose this, here's what happens. So you can think of like, I could very easily specify a number of games as a matrix game. For example, rock, paper, scissors could be a matrix game. I could have rock, paper, and scissors and then specify all the outcomes, right? So that is an outcome matrix form of a game. So, so far we have actions, right? I can choose alpha or beta. We have strategies and we have outcomes. So this is not yet a game. What are we actually missing from this game? Okay, so let's go back. And so what is missing here? Well, it's not easy to see what's missing. What's missing is payoffs. Payoffs meaning how much do we actually care about this? right? So outcomes are fine. They tell us what's going to happen in the real world. But what we really care about isn't the outcome itself, but how much we care about the outcome, how much we desire the outcome, right? So payoffs. What is our actual objective or our goal in the game? Is it to get an A? Is it to get at least a B minus, right? So 
Game theory can't help you decide your objectives or payoffs. Like, it can't tell you that an A is better than a C. It can't tell you that a B plus is better than a B minus. But what it can do is that if you do have numerical payoffs, game theory can help you achieve them. So for example, maybe um, different types of payoffs in this game could be like, maybe I'm super greedy and I only care about my own grade, right? So I might assign a really high value to me getting an A and them getting a C. But if I kind of cared more about the other person as well, maybe, like for example, if I was super greedy, I would want this outcome because I get an A and I don't care what the other person gets. But maybe this is like my best friend or my sibling or something like that. And I would prefer us both to get a B plus than me to get an A and them to get a C. It all depends on how you are formulating your goal for this game. So the outcomes are different from the payoffs and the payoffs are really what we care about. We are going to associate some numerical value with the outcomes and the numerical value, then since we have a number, we can try and maximize that number, okay? So payoff examples. So some payoff is going to be, I'm going to assign a numerical value to an outcome. And it basically says, how much do I like or how much do I desire that outcome? And the more that I desire the outcome, the higher the payoff. For example, imagine one of the players is greedy and assigns higher payoffs if they do better than the partner. So for example, let's say that they say, okay, um, if both of us get a B minus, it's a neutral. And B minus is kind of a neutral grade. I'm not super sad. I'm not super happy. But if I get an A, I am super happy about that. So I'm going to say that's a three, for example. Okay. So let's just assign some numbers here. And this is sort of an arbitrary assignment of numbers. And it just says that for the outcome of both of us getting a B minus, Let's say we are both greedy and we both only care about ourselves. So both of us getting a B minus, both of us think that's sort of a zero, right? So it's a bit of neutral. Both of us getting a B plus, well, we both think that that's a, like, it's a little bit better than a B minus. So maybe that's a one, right? Over here, if I get an A and you get a C, I think that's a three. That's awesome. I got an A. But if I get a C and you get an A, I think that's a negative one. C is brutal. So I don't want to see. So I'm going to have a negative one. So we are just picking numbers out of thin air. And the example here is that people are greedy and they want a higher grade. That is the example that we're currently working with. Now, these numbers, this could have been a million. This could have been a billion or a trillion. It doesn't matter. I'm just keeping the numbers simple where a higher grade is equal to a higher number. And now that we have numbers we can start to talk about which, which selection would we want mathematically, all right? So our numbers here in the payoff matrix, that's called utility. So utility is a game theoretic term for essentially how much do I want that thing? How much utility does it give me, right? How much does it add value to my life, essentially? So players should attempt to maximize utility. All right, so in this example, both of us getting a B, B minus, I think that's a zero. Me getting an A, you getting a C, that's a three. I only care about myself. I don't care that you got that C, okay? So that is the payoffs for this particular example. All right, so now that we have payoffs, what should you do? What should you do here? Well, you're attempting to maximize your payoff. That's what you're trying to do, maximize your utility. So what we're gonna do is we're going to consider all the choices. So what you might do here is if you're given a matrix of values, you might think, okay, uh, like what if I choose alpha? Well, there's a bigger number here. What if I choose beta? There's a bigger number here. Like maybe I want to uh, have the best best case or the, the best worst case or something like that. But there is a mathematical way to think about this. There is an algorithm. So what we're going to do is we are first going to look at all of the choices of our partner. So we're going to say, 
What could they do? And based on what they could do, I'm going to pick what I want to do. All right, so let's consider now that my partner chose alpha. So over here, the partner, let's, let's just assume that they're going to choose alpha. So if they choose alpha, if I choose alpha, I get a zero. If I choose beta, I get a negative one, okay? If they chose beta, so now they've chosen beta, let's see what I can do. If I choose alpha, I get a three. If I choose beta, I get a one. So look at this. If they choose alpha, alpha is my best choice. If they choose beta, alpha is also my best choice. So alpha is my best choice no matter what, okay? So let's just go through that one more time because it's very important. If the partner chooses, so what we do is we do not look at our own choices first. We look at the other player's possible actions first. So if the other player were to choose alpha, if I chose alpha, that's better than choosing beta. If the other player chose beta instead, alpha is still my best choice. So alpha is always my best choice. You would be foolish to choose beta in this particular payoff matrix, okay? So, strategy domination. Here's a definition for you. We say that a strategy, call that strategy alpha, strictly dominates another strategy beta if my payoff from alpha is strictly greater than that of beta no matter what the other players do. Okay, so no matter what the other player did, if they chose alpha or they chose beta, alpha was always my best choice. So that means alpha strictly dominates beta in this example. Okay, if there were different numbers here, maybe that would not be the case. But in, the, in this case, with these numbers, that is the case. So do not play a strictly dominated strategy. Never choose beta in this case. The strategy that dominates the dominated strategy is better in every possible case, right? So if I were to give you this on an exam, these exact numbers and tell you what would you choose, beta is wrong. <laughs> it is always worse. And the reasoning for that would be Beta is a dominated strategy, so we are going to pick the strategy that dominates it, which is alpha. Okay, so that is strategy domination. Now, this, maybe some of you out there were saying, I've heard of this sort of game before. Well, there is a game that is very similar to this. It is called The Prisoner's Dilemma. Who's heard of The Prisoner's Dilemma out there? In The Prisoner's Dilemma, let's say two people get arrested. Right? They're, maybe they're partners in crime. Maybe they're innocent, maybe they're not. The two prisoners have been taken by the police, so they can't talk, right? They're put in two separate cells at the other, at the ends of the prison. The guards are gonna come in to each prisoner and they're gonna ask them to rat the other person out. So you just admit that the other person did it, okay? Someone's asking if this is live, this is, this is live. Um, the, the video will be up later for, um, for people to watch later. So in the prisoner's dilemma, the guards are asking people, hey, you should tell on your buddy, right? Um, that's what we want. We want to get a confession. So rat the other person out. So here's the outcome. The, the, the actions that you can do as the prisoner is to tell on your buddy, right? To, to confess and tell on your buddy or stay silent. Those are the two actions. So if neither of them tell on each other, so if both of them stay silent, well, the guards don't really have any evidence, but they're upset, right? They have a little bit of evidence, but not enough to really put them away without a confession. And so if, if both of them just stay quiet, they both go to jail for a year. If they both tell on each other, then yes, now they have hard evidence, but at least they were honest right? So they both go to jail for two years. However, if one tells on the other one and the other one stays silent, the one who ratted goes free and the other one goes to jail for five years, 
right? So if I said, yeah, 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 he did it, and then that other person stays silent, well, I'm going to go, like, I, I was truthful, right? So I get to go free, and now they have evidence on the other person, and so that person goes to jail for five years. So this is obviously not, like, necessarily a real-life scenario, but this is the logic and the intuition behind the prisoner's dilemma, okay? So let's make the payoff matrix. So let's say that the payoffs are negatively associated with that prison term. So going to jail for one year is a negative one payoff. Going to jail for two years is a negative two payoff. Going free is zero. It's, it's no sentence. And going to jail for five years is negative five. So here we go. So here is prisoner number one and here is prisoner number two. They both have a choice. Right? And that choice is either to tell on the other person or to say silent. So if prisoner, um, so, so here we go. So if they both tell, they both go to jail for two years. If they both stay silent, they both go to jail for one year. If one stays silent and the other person tells, the person who stays silent goes to jail for five years and the person who told gets a zero. So my question to you now, and I'll give you like 20 seconds, is what would you do and why? What would you do and why in this particular scenario? Now, I'm not saying, would you rat on your friend? I'm telling you, I'm asking you mathematically, what would you do with these payoffs? Okay? Because, you know, in the real world, maybe if you tell on your partner in crime and they go to jail, you're going to get shanked when you leave, you know, when you go back to your other criminal buddies. So like these aren't necessarily like actual real world values, but I'm I'm what I'm telling you is I've given you these payoffs. What would you do? So someone out there said that telling dominates not telling. Okay, let's have a look to see if that's true. So what do we do? We first look at everything that our opponent could do, our other player in the game could do. Not necessarily opponent, but the other player. So if player number two, if prisoner two chooses to tell, okay, someone else said, I'm going to tell because it's either two years or free, unlike getting five years. Yeah. So that's a good situation. Like it's good logic to say, Hey, you know, I want the, the best outcome or something like that, or the least bad outcome, but let's actually look at this mathematically. So if prisoner number two has chosen to tell, so now we're looking at this column. Okay. So if I choose to tell, I get negative two. If I choose to say silent, I get negative five. However, if prisoner cho two chose to say silent, if I choose to tell, I get zero. If I choose to say silent, I get negative one. So in this particular case of these payoffs, ratting out the other prisoner strictly dominates not ratting them out, right? So if these numbers correlate exactly to your real world goal, then telling is always better. You always want to tell in that case. All right. Now, again, as I said, if you are in a real criminal organization, maybe do not apply these rules, right? Because maybe, yeah, you didn't go to prison, but something even worse might be waiting for you on the outside. Okay. But mathematically speaking, for these payoffs, it's always better to tell. Now, who saw this game show? This game show called Split or Steal. This game show was hilarious. I think it was on Fox or Game Show Network or something like that. And what happened is they gave two contestants two golden balls, right? And the golden balls were essentially just the secret decision. Like, I'm going to write Split or I'm going to write Steal. And so each contestant chooses a ball and then they have this reveal at the end where they choose split or they choose steal. And now the, the point of the, the game show is that let's say there's $100,000 up for grabs, right? If they both choose split, they each get half of the money. If they both choose steal, they both get nothing. If one chooses split and one chooses steal, the stealer gets all of it. So this is the prisoner's dilemma, right? This is exactly the prisoner's dilemma. And this clip from down here is like 
kind of sad, but also kind of hilarious. Who knows if the show was real or if it was staged, but they said it was real. So in this case, I, I believe it's this woman. I think this is the clip from this episode that I'm about to talk about, where this woman, like, sweet talks the guy the whole episode. So the episode is like a half an hour or an hour long, something crazy. And all it is, is the show is trying to soak the most, most drama out of this thing as possible, right? So they say, oh, talk about your mother who's dying and you need the money for her surgery. Or like, you know, I got three kids and my husband left me. So all this kind of stuff. So she lays this, you know, this attractive woman lays this sob story on this man and says like, listen, I only need $50,000. We are both $50,000 could help pay for this surgery or whatever, or my kids could go to college. And like he, she completely convinces the guy to choose split. And in the end she chooses steel. And like the guy is like, you know, really upset and all kinds of stuff. And so that's the drama of the show. So, um, let's see what what actually let, let's put some numbers on this and apply some game theory to this okay so here is the split or steal payoffs is if i choose split and the other player chooses split we both get half if we both choose steal we both get nothing if one person chooses steal and the other person chooses split the stealer gets everything okay so let's apply our logic to this so if the other player chooses split, if I choose split, I get half. If I choose steal, I get one. If the other player chooses steal, if I choose split, I get zero. If I choose steal, I get zero. Okay. So stealing weakly dominates splitting. So that means that weak domination means that my choice does as good or better every time okay so in the case of weak domination stealing does better if they choose split but it does the same if they choose steal okay so weak domination means that i do as good or better each time and so the game creates drama by allowing the players to talk to each other and try and make some sort of deal but if we have these payoffs you should steal, right? But let's look at this for an example, for, for a second. So I have given you these payoffs and the payoffs are directly correlated with the amount of money that is won. However, there's a very important note when you go to apply game theory to something is that this is not always the case. Decision-making using game theory assumes that the payoff is accurate for your utility. So, for example, if someone came up to you and offered you a million dollars, right, as split or steal, it, your decision making might be different if it was a hundred dollars, right? Because if it's a hundred dollars, you don't care that much. So maybe if it's a hundred dollars here, like the numbers are different. However, the difference to your life, a million dollars might not be twice as good as $500,000, right? So, for example, if someone offered me right now $500,000, I would put way more than half of the value of a million dollars on that because it allows me to basically accomplish whatever I want in my life. And everything more than that is just a bonus. So whereas before I said that this was half and half, well, it might actually be more than half for you. The numbers might be different, right? And you might actually care about the other person too. So you may actually put a higher value on splitting than you did on stealing because now both of you walk away happy versus if you were a very empathetic individual, maybe you would feel horrible about stealing all the money from someone, right? So. We said here that stealing weakly dominates splitting, so you should always steal. But that's only the case if this is your utility. So just be careful when you form your matrix because you may have different values than someone else. All right? This is the payoff matrix for someone who values money linearly and doesn't care about the other person whatsoever. So the direct translation from real life prizes into your payoff matrix might be very difficult. 
With that in mind, my favorite ever episode of this show, and I think that the I think that this episode really was the downfall of the show because I think it was only on for like one season. But this guy comes on and I think he's an engineer. He's like, he knows what the prisoner's dilemma is. So the guy walks on and they're trying to get, you know, they, the whole show thrives on the drama. But this, this nerd walks on like someone like me and he just says, listen, whatever you're about to say, I don't care. You can tell me literally anything. I'm going to choose steel. That's it. I'm choosing steel. So you can either choose steel and get nothing, or you can choose split, and then you'll get nothing, but I'll give you half of my money. So there's no obligation. You can lie all you want, right? Any They, they say at the beginning of the show, if someone says, I'll give you half if you choose split, you don't have to give them half, right? But this, this like, total Chad just walks on and he's like, listen, I'm choosing steel. If you choose steel, neither of us are getting anything. I'll still be happy with my life. We'll walk away and it'll be done. So the other guy is just like, what are you talking about? Like, let's talk about this. He says, nope. I'm choosing steel. He's like, but if we both choose split and all that, and the guy tries to make these arguments, and the guy just says, listen, I'm choosing steel, no matter what. I'll still be fine if I don't get the 100,000, blah, blah, blah. So the other guy is just like, well, this sucks, and the host doesn't know what to do, and the audience is just laughing. And then, so the other guy is just like, well, okay, I guess I have to choose split and hope that you give half the money. And so the guy, the other guy like reluctantly opens up and he shows that he chose split because the other guy said he was going to steal. And then the first guy reveals that he actually chose split as well, right? Knowing that the other guy <laughs> would not choose steal and get nothing, his only hope of getting anything was to choose split. But then the first guy was just this huge troll and chose split anyway, right? So I, I really love that episode because it was like this game theorist, like this game theoretic approach to it by just saying, listen, either, either way, you're getting nothing. So like, <laughs> it, it was kind of funny. So that has nothing to do with the exam, but I thought it was really interesting. Okay, back to the lecture. So back to the grades game. I talked about the grades game. These were the grades, right? These were the the outcomes, not the payoffs, but the outcomes. These were the grade results. And then we had payoffs based on those if the players were greedy, right? So if the players only care about themselves, here are the numerical playoffs, payoffs. However, what might the payoff matrix look like if we had players that had different motivations in mind that weren't just greedy, okay? So different payoffs. So the previous payoffs were for greedy players. So for example, if both players got a B minus, it was sort of neutral. If I got an A, I really liked that. So that was a three. I didn't care that you got a C, I'm greedy. What if now we have some caring players, some emotional players who like care about the other person too, for example. So before, if I got an A and you got a C, that was a three for me because I didn't care what you got. But now maybe, I kind of care that the other person got less than me. And so let's say if I get an A and you got a C, I feel really guilty about that, that I got a bigger grade. So that actually becomes like a negative one. Let's just say, I'm just assigning values to these and giving them some intuition. But now where I got a C and you got an A was a negative one, now maybe that becomes a negative three because I'm super emotional and I'm angry that you made me get less. Right? So let's just change the payoff matrix a little bit. So before both of these people, this was the greedy player matrix, right? So in this example, both players are greedy and assign higher payoff to their own grade and nothing else. They don't factor in what happens to the other player at all. So what if each of the other people cared about each other? So that three, maybe I have some guilt, like I said before, and that becomes a negative one. And maybe this negative one, I'm angry because the other person made me get less. And so now there is a, oh, a spoiler alert. <laughs> now I have some different payoffs, right? So it's still zero, zero here, one here, but now I have different payoffs. So 
Someone asked, all of this assumes you know the utility of each decision for the other player. Yes. So by forming these matrices, I'm giving you the payoffs. I am going through some intuition to form these payoff matrices, but when you're actually forming these in real life, if you want to apply a matrix game to something, you actually have to come up with these somehow, right? But I'm just giving you examples and teaching you the math. The, the harder part is not the math or the algorithm, it's actually coming up with the, with the payoffs. So let's look now. Let's say we both have these caring players and here's their new matrix. So is there a dominated strategy? Well, I already spoiled that a little bit, but let's go through the process. If my partner chooses alpha, my alpha will give me zero and beta will give me negative three. So if they choose alpha, I want to choose alpha. If they chose beta, alpha will give me negative one and beta will give me one. So in this case, there is no dominated strategy. So what would you choose, right? If there's no, if there's no thing that's always better, what will I choose? Well, in the best case, if, if for example, now that there's no thing that's always better, how do I make a choice? Well, there's two main strategies that people use. One might be, I'm going to choose the thing that gives me the best outcome. And someone else might say, I want to choose the thing that gives me the best worst outcome. What do I mean by that? Well, the best case out outcome is if I choose beta and they choose beta, right? But if I choose beta, there's a chance they choose alpha and I get negative three. So that's kind of bad. So if I'm looking at maximizing my worst case, if I choose alpha, the worst thing that can happen is I get a negative one. So here, there's no best answer, right? There's no dominated strategy. So we cannot say, always choose this thing. So you're going to have to make a decision based on, hey, do I want to take a chance at the best outcome or maybe hedge my bets and take the best worst case instead? Okay, so there's no best possible choice here. There's no single best choice. What if now, instead of both players being greedy or both players being caring, I'm going to, excuse me, what if the payoffs for both players are different? Because so far, these have all been symmetric payoffs, right? Meaning that, well, obviously, if we both choose the same thing, they're the same, right? But if we choose opposites, then it's just a mirror image. So they've been symmetric so far. But what if we have different payoffs for each player? What does that mean? So over here, I had the greedy matrix. And over here, I have the caring matrix. So what if I want to be greedy? If I know I'm greedy and I know the other person is caring. So let's take the greedy payoffs for me and we'll take the caring payoffs for the other person and we will form a matrix out of those, okay? So now we no longer have a symmetric matrix. So as the greedy player, this is the greedy player's choice, this is the caring player's choice. Is there a dominated strategy in this game? Let's have a look, okay? So if I'm doing these man this many examples, it probably means that this is gonna be on the exam, okay? So make sure you know how to do this. So for the greedy player, if we're the greedy player, is there a dominated strategy? So let's fix the caring player at alpha. If I choose alpha, I get zero. If I choose beta, I get negative one. So if they choose alpha, alpha is best. If they choose beta, if I choose alpha, I get three. If I choose beta, I get one. So if they choose beta, three is best. So yes, alpha dominates beta. Okay, alpha dominates beta. Now, let's flip the script and see now I am the caring player. So we're gonna flip everything around and do the same thing. So I'm the caring player. As the caring player now, which strategy do I choose? Well, we're going to apply the same logic. We're going to see if there's a dominated strategy. So fix the greedy player at alpha. If, they, if they're fixed at alpha, I get zero if I choose alpha, I get negative three if I choose beta. So if they choose alpha, alpha is best. But if they choose beta, if I choose alpha, I get negative one. 
If they choose beta, I get one. So for alpha, alpha is best. For beta, beta is best. So there is no dominated strategy. Okay? So what would I choose here if I'm the caring player? What would I choose if I'm the caring player? Does anyone have an idea out there? Just pause it for a second and think about what you would choose if you were the caring player here. But there's no dominated strategy. If there's no dominated strategy, what would you pick? All right. Now that you've unpaused, let's think about this for a second. The greedy player, we just analyzed the greedy player. Even though for caring, nothing is dominated, so I don't have a best choice, for the greedy player, for the other person, alpha dominates beta. So if the greedy player, if we think our opponent is a good player, then the opponent is going to choose alpha, right? Because alpha is always better for them than beta. So if we know that, if we know alpha is always better for the opponent than beta, then we know they will choose alpha. So if we know that they are going to choose alpha, well, we are going to choose the best possible response to alpha, which is alpha, right? So if we know that alpha is the best choice for them, we can assume they are going to make the best choice for them because there would be no reason for, for them to not make the best choice. It always gives them something better. So if we know they're picking alpha, then we pick alpha. So the best response to the greedy player's selection of alpha is for us to choose alpha because beta would be worse. So if you put yourself in another person's shoes, figure out what they are going to do, that can help you make your decision. So if your opponent has a dominated strategy, you know they are not going to choose a dominated strategy, okay? And therefore you can fix their strategy and then choose a best response. So the definition of a best response, the strategy which performs best against a given other strategy is a best response. In the previous example, we knew that the other player had a best choice, so we choose our best response to their best choice. And so Sun Tzu said, to know your enemy, you must become your enemy, right? And that's very true. You become your enemy, you fix their choice to their best choice if they have one, and then you make your best choice. So all this being said now, what makes a game? Well, a game consists of the following things. There are a number of players, I, J, K, L, M. There's some number of players, right? There are a number of things related to strategy. So S, I is a particular strategy of I. So what, the, what does that mean? Um, right now, this slide is pertaining to the numbers game, the picking of a number between one and a hundred, okay? So if we break that game down into its components, where we pick a number between one and a hundred, and then the winner is the person close to two thirds of the average, here, the players are all the players choosing a number for that game, right? So let's say you are I, your player I. Strategy SI is a particular player choosing a number. So SI 13 means that player I chose the number 13. Capital S I is the set of all possible strategies of I, meaning the possible things that player I could have chosen are the numbers one to a hundred, okay? So the set of all possible strategies that is one to a hundred, but a particular strategy is the thing that you have chosen from the set of all strategies. A strategy profile is a particular playing of the game. So it is an assignment of the, the picks of everybody to a strategy, right? So that spreadsheet I had of all the players with all of their choices, that is a strategy profile. So I've chosen this, you've chosen this, they've chosen this. That is a strategy profile. S minus I are the choices for all people but player I. And the utility of player I for S is the utility of payoff for that for player I 
given that everybody has chosen something. So what does that mean? Well, let's go back here. Let me get rid of these, um, these things here. So in this case, uh, the set of all strategies for both players would be alpha and beta. That is the capital S. Each player can choose alpha or beta. Okay. If we have chosen, for example, if we have played the game and the caring player has chosen alpha and the greedy player has chosen beta, then S sub I for caring is alpha. S sub J for greedy is beta. S, which is the choices for everybody, is a mapping from players to their choices. So it would be alpha for the first person and beta for the second person. Okay, so that's what those things mean. Let me get rid of this again. And then the utility are the numbers associated with player I. And we're going to assume that all of those things are known values, okay? So far, or so here's an example game. So far, we've been kind of playing these symmetric games where people have the same choices, but it's not necessarily the case that people can always have the same choices, okay? So um, here's a game. Let's say uh, what I like to sort of envision this game as is, uh, let's say you're playing soccer or something, and it's like uh, the goalie is in the net, right? So the goalie is here in the net and you're over here with the ball. So you've got the soccer ball and you have to choose where to kick the ball, okay? So your choices might be something like um, kick to the left, kick to the right, kick to the middle. And then maybe the goalie's choices are like, do I have to go, do I wanna go left? Do I wanna go top left? Do I wanna go bottom right? Something like that. So it's not always the case that our choices are exactly the same, okay? So let me let me discard that. That's just an example where choices might not be the same. So in this game, if I were to give you this game on an exam, you should be able to tell me the following information. Okay, the players are player one and player two. The strategy sets, S1 is top or bottom, so T and B. So player one can choose top, or bottom. S2 is LCR, left, center, or right. So um, player two can choose to go left, center, or right. Okay, so those are the strategy sets. The payoffs, so the payoff, the utility for player one, for them choosing top, and the other person choosing center, so they choose top, the other person chooses center, is 11. Okay, utility two, meaning the utility for player two, of player one choosing bottom and player two choosing left is four. Okay, so that's that's how we define these games. Let's look at this game. Does player one have a dominated strategy? Pause the video now and and work that out for yourself. Okay, so player one, does it have a dominated strategy? So player one, we are trying to choose for player one. So let's fix the other person's stuff, all right? So if they choose left, my best choice is going to be bottom, right? Because it's six versus five. If they choose center, my best choice is going to be top. If they choose right, my best choice is going to be bottom. So no, player one does not have a dominated strategy because it is not always better to choose top or bottom. Okay, let me discard those things. Does player two have a dominated strategy? Now, this is a little bit tricky. So look at this. If we fix top for player one, if we choose left, our best thing is center, right? If we choose bottom, our best thing is six or sorry, our best thing is left. So the best thing we can do if we choose top is to choose center. The best thing if they choose bottom is to choose left. However, so you might say there is no dominated strategy, but that is not the, do the definition of a dominated strategy does not mean is there always a best thing. A dominated strategy is is there something that's always worse than something else? And it actually is true. 
center dominates right. Well, what the hell do I mean by that? If we choose top, so if we fix top for player one, center does better than right. Okay? If we choose, oh, and that's because it's the, sorry, I'm choosing the wrong values here. I should be looking at the second values. So if we choose, if we fix top for player one, center does better than right. If we fix bottom for player one, then center does better than right. See how that works? So domination is not about something being the best. It's about something being worse than something else all of the time. So I apologize. When I did that initial calculation there, I circled the 11, but it was the payoffs for um, player two are on the right. So I was supposed to be circling this. So that is what was supposed to be circled. Apologies for that. So dominated strategy. If I ask if there is a dominated strategy, it doesn't mean is there a single strategy that dominates everything else? It means, is there a case where one strategy always does better than the other? So what we can tell from this is that we would never choose right because center is always better. Okay. So all we can say is that we're never going to choose right because center is always better. Okie doke. So let's keep going. So a strictly dominated strategy, the definition now that we have our mathematical tools, player I's strategy, SI prime, is strictly dominated by player I's strategy SI if, so SI is always better than SI prime if the utility for SI fixing everything else for every other player is greater than the utility of SI prime fixing everything else for every possible thing that could be done. So for every possible thing that could be done by everything else. So, there, you know, we could have like cube games where there's more than two players, but it just means if we fix everything that the other player can do, is there a strategy that always perform worse than something else? Okay. So that's what this means. If we fix everything, so the set of all possible strategies minus myself, that means for everything that every, everybody else can do, is the utility of this other thing always bigger than the utility for SI prime? That is a strictly dominated strategy. That's the new definition. Let's do one more game. You're a general defending a city. You have an army, okay? And the attacker has two armies. There are two paths leading into the city. So you have a city. There's an easy path into the city. There is a hard path into the city. So the easy path meaning, okay, uh, there's like a big open field that their army, the enemy could come through a big open field and attack your city, or they could come through the mountains, right? So this hard path is really hard for the enemy to get through. You can only defend one of those paths. So the rules are, if the attacker chooses the hard path, they lose an army. So this is like Hannibal crossing the Alps or whatever, right? So they have two armies, but one of their armies is going to die if they choose the hard path, okay? If your armies meet, then the attacker is going to lose one army. So your enemy wants to maximize the number of armies that get into the city. That is their goal. So here is the view of this. You have an army, right? You've got a bunch of soldiers in here. Your enemy could either come through the hard path and they have two armies. If they go through the hard path, they're going to lose an army because it's really hard to get through the hard path. If they go through the easy path, then they're going to get to your place with two armies. So you've got to choose, do I defend the hard path or do I defend the easy path? Okay. And if you're, if you choose the place where they end up going, then they will lose an army through your battle. If you choose the other place, then they will not lose an additional army and they will just get into the city. 
okay? So here is the payoff matrix. For the attacker, the payoff is the number of armies that reach the city, okay? So if you are the defender and they are the attacker, the payoff for the attacker is the number of armies that meet this, meet this, reach the city. So if you choose to defend easy and they chose to attack easy, oh, let me say this as well. For the defense, the payoff for the defense is the number of attacking armies that were killed, okay? So if the attacker cho chose to come the easy route, they will arrive at your city with two armies. If you chose to defend the easy route, you will meet them there and kill one army. So you have killed one army and they have one army in your city. So that's the payoff for easy, easy. If they chose to attack easy, but you chose to defend hard, then you have killed none of their armies because they came in through the easy door and that's the best case for them. They just walked right in and they didn't lose any of their armies. So two armies are in the city. Now, if they chose to attack through the herd route, then, and you chose to defend easy, then they lost one army getting to the city. So they get one army in your city and one of their armies has been killed by going the herd route, right? However, if they chose to go herd and you chose to defend herd, this is kind of the best case scenario for you because none of their armies have reached the city because only one got through the herd route and then you killed the other one and you have killed both of their armies. So does defense have a dominated strategy? So let's do the calculation. If the enemy chooses easy, if I choose easy, there's one. However, if I choose herd, it's zero. So if they choose easy, I want to choose easy. If they choose herd, oh look, herd is my best choice. So defense does not have a dominated strategy, okay? But does the attacker have a dominated strategy? Let's look at that. So if we fix the actions of the defender, so if the defender is choosing easy, well, the attacker is going to get the best thing from either of them. If the, so if the opponent chooses defend easy, I get the same outcome as the attacker. However, if the opponent chooses to defend hard, then I get two by choosing easy and zero by choosing hard. So for the attacker, easy weakly dominates hard because it will do at least as well or better no matter what the opponent does. So here's the definition of weakly dominated. It means that for some strategy, it's, sorry, for some or all strategies, it's greater than or equal to the utility of other things, but there is also something in which it is greater than it, okay? So for something, it's better. So for here, in if the, if the defender chooses hard, easy is better. If the defender chooses easy, it's the same. So it's weakly dominated, okay? Easy weakly dominates hard. So you probably shouldn't play a weakly dominated strategy. So that means since for the attacker, herd is, e is weakly dominated by easy, it's probably the case that the attacker is not going to go the herd route. So that means you know the attacker is probably going to take the easy road, so you defend easy, okay? So the attacker knows it shouldn't go herd because easy weakly dominates it. So you're pretty sure that if you've done this analysis of putting yourself in the attacker's shoes, it's going to choose easy. So if you know to choose easy, then um, if you know they are going to choose easy, choose the best response. That's the word I was looking for. So the best response to the attacker choosing easy is easy. All right, so here's a recap for today's lecture. Games have players, strategies, and payoffs. Players want to maximize their payoff. A strategy, a strategy dominates another if it is either always better, strict domination, or at least as good, weak domination. Never choose to play a dominated strategy. Never, because it's never as good. 
it's always worse than choosing the strategy that dominates it. And if there is no overall best strategy to play, then consider, is there a dominated strategy for the opponent? And if there is, pick a best response to that, okay? Nobody teaches you this. Nobody teaches you how to make decisions. You just kind of go with like, oh, I have two minutes to make a decision, right? And you just sort of the emotionally choosing the best one, right? Don't do that. Analyze it. Put it into numbers. Maximize those numbers. Use game theory. Some possible exam questions for this. Given a payoff matrix, compute the dominated strategies. Um, explain why a given choice of strategy is good or bad for a given matrix. Compute the best response to a strategy. Or construct a payoff matrix such that a given strategy dominates another strategy. Okay? So these are the type of things I may ask on an exam. And that's it. We will have a, another lecture on game theory in the next lecture on Tuesday. So uh, I had a couple of questions out there, but uh, I, I, they're not really relevant, so I'm not going to read those questions. But thank you for participating in the chat. And I will see you on next Tuesday for game theory number two. We will be talking about uh, Nash equilibria, which are very, very cool. And then that will all tie into the Minimax and Alpha Beta algorithms. Oh, one more question. Uh, do you infer the probability of other players' choice from known cost payoff matrix? So the example that we just did showed that if you don't have a dominating strategy, so if you don't have a best strategy, look at what the opponent will do. If the opponent has a best strategy, then you know 100% that they will pick that best strategy. So you pick a best response to that strategy. That's all we can ever say. We're not going into like probabilities or averages of, or any of that sort of thing. We're just saying, if there is a best thing, take it. If there's not, try and figure out if your opponent has a best thing, fix that, and then choose your best response to that. Great, all right. See you in the next lecture. Thanks for watching.